and will join us again in the fall. This is our last talk for this series. In September, we will have a talk from Roberta Hill on the invasive species affecting our lake waters. In October, Doug Hitchcock from Maine Audubon is going to address ethical issues around wildlife from many different angles and I think will be fascinating. And in November, Patty Cormier is going to return and we'll give a discussion on the particular characteristics of trees. Why are leaves lobed? Why is bark the way it is, et cetera. So we're hoping you can all join us for that. We hope to be live, but we will let you know. Tonight, we are uh, continuing our series of bird success stories with Patrick Kark, who uh, will discuss peregrines on Mount Desert and is also going to discuss some of the hawk watches and I think has maybe a few other things. He is an ornithological ranger on the wonderful Mount Desert Island. Uh, Nick is doing our monitoring here and he has asked me to request that you save your questions till the end. Use the Q&A please and not the chat. And to remind everybody also, if you're interested, this is being recorded and will be available. So without any further taking time from Patrick, I will turn it over to Patrick Kark. Thank you for joining us, Patrick. Thank you and uh, thanks for the invite from Western Maine Audubon to come out and speak to everyone today. I'm very excited to talk about it. This uh, raptor conservation um, in, in and around Acadia National Park is probably one of my favorite things to discuss. So I'm really excited to um, be able to give that pre presentation to everyone today. Uh, first off, just before we begin, I just want to uh, answer. We did get uh, a question from Dan beforehand, so I can just address that before we get into the presentation. Um, that you had two chicks at Jordan Cliffs and three at Valley Cove are the correct numbers for peregrine falcon fledglings from the year 2020. Um, as we'll notice there, and we'll get in discussions there, uh, one of our main sites, the precipice did fail. Um, we don't 100% know for sure, but um, my best guess is we did get hit by some weather, uh, significant weather with a cold snap around the end of April last year, which is a pretty critical time for peregrine falcon fledgling success. And the fact that if they had hatched out of those eggs and then had a period of a couple of days of heavy rains and then close to freezing temperatures, um, that is probably what ended up causing them to fail. And although we saw a little bit of interesting behavior to see if they were going to re-nest, it did not seem that they ever successfully re-nested. And so we did have a failure at the precipice last year. Um, but with that, as we get into the presentation, um, first off, I just wanna really talk or introduce you all to myself a little bit and why I'm so passionate about this topic. Uh, so, of course, my name is Patrick, uh, and I hail from Colorado, but peregrines are the reason I'm out here in Maine today. Um, eight years ago, just after I graduated Colorado State University with a degree in zoology, I was lucky enough to come out to Acadia National Park and be the raptor intern. Uh, that is probably going to be the coolest job title I'll ever have in my life, and it's only downhill from there. Uh, but uh, being a Raptor intern was amazing. It was an opportunity for me to begin science communication, uh, have a, a wonderful opportunity of viewing peregrine falcons in their natural habitat, and of course sharing uh, their success story um, all across the world, but specifically here in Acadia National Park to hundreds of visitors a day. Um, I was lucky enough that that internship didn't turn into an ornithology ranger position for me. Um, and I have been uh, an ornithology ranger at Acadia for seven more years. And it has been an amazing experience. And I love that I can keep continuing to do that year in and year out. But of course, uh, today we are going to begin off by talking about 
uh, the Peregrine Falcon conservation story here on Mount Desert Island. And uh, really to understand that conservation story, we'll just do a brief um, coverage of what caused the decline of peregrine falcons and other raptor species um, throughout uh, North America. And that has everything to do uh, with a chemical called DDT. Um, DDT was a chemical that was invented uh, just after World or during World War II. Uh, and it uh, was found out to be an incredible insecticide and uh, it, it was long lasting. It stayed on the crops and the fields and therefore protected the crops for much longer than, a, or than current pesticides at the time could. However, that ability to be long lasting, as we now know, did end up contributing to the decline of raptor species. Uh, as DDT laid on the environment, it would uh, degrade into another form of the chemical called DDE, and that chemical um, started causing issues. Um, through a process called bioaccumulation, we started to see DDE um, concentrations within birds skyrocket to the point where um, in peregrine falcons in particular, the DDE concentrations became so high, it actually started to inhibit their ability to create calcium. Um, and that of course was very important for their ability to produce healthy eggs. Um, in the bottom right picture here, we do have two peregrine falcon eggs that because of that <clears throat> um, limit of calcium production, you would be able to pick up these eggs and just kind of pinch them closed with your fingers. This of course didn't give them great protection and we started to see um, no population recruitment for peregrine falcons. And DDT was heavily sprayed throughout North America in the 1950s. Um, but again, that long lasting effect stayed in the populations and we started to see a decline in peregrine falcon numbers through the 50s, 60s and into the 70s. And one of the big reasons why it was so unnoticed is the fact that this chemical didn't kill adult birds. Um, if you had a peregrine falcon pair that lived near you during this time, you probably saw it in 1953, you saw it in 54, 55, so on and so forth until eventually those birds would have died of, <coughs> excuse me, of old age. But because of this uh, problem in the eggshells, no young falcons were being produced to replace those adults once they died off. And therefore, very suddenly we saw a decline in the numbers. <coughs> Eventually, um, a wonderful woman named Rachel Carson wrote a book called Silent Spring. And it was really one of the first documents to explore the idea of uh, chemicals and the impact that we have on our environment and how that can cascade through a system. Um, we had, you know, it was starting to be in scientific documents, uh, but what, at least in my opinion, why I deem Silent Spring so highly in regard to helping peregrine falcon conservation is this was one of the first times we saw science communication. Rachel Carson took this idea that had been found out in the scientific community, but presented it in a way that was available to the public. And um, through that, public opinion was able to shift and DDT was banned for use in 1972 in the United States. <coughs> Excuse me. And um, has continued to see uh, little to no use in North America since that time. But at that point, <clears throat> the damage was done. Um, a 1970 survey uh, done throughout North America, but highly focused on um, high density areas of peregrine falcons, were only able to find um, minimal pairs in what we would still consider excellent peregrine falcon range. <coughs> And unfortunately, uh, that decline really hit uh, a subspecies of peregrine falcon called Falco peregrinus anatum uh, to the point where that subspecies, which is the Eastern subspecies of peregrine falcon also was referenced as the duck-footed falcon, 
um, it was extirpated from the wild. Um, there were still some anatoms in captivity owned by falconers, uh, but at least when it came to wild populations of the birds, they could no longer be found. Uh, but through um, Silent Spring and Rachel Carson and roughly a just strong push towards conservation efforts in the late 60s and early 70s, peregrine falcons were deemed an important um, species to bring back. We of course had the Endangered Species Act beginning here in the country as well. And in 1972, reintroduction began in the Chesapeake Bay area for peregrine falcons. <coughs> Excuse me, sorry about that. <clears throat> when it comes to uh, reintroduction of peregrine falcons and having so such limited population throughout the country, we, and by we, I mean the conservation agencies, National Park Service, state agencies, nonprofits, and a lot of private falconers work together to create a hacking program. And hacking is a term for raising peregrine falcon fledglings in captivity. In this case, they grabbed peregrine falcons from around the world, including anatom subspecies that were falconer birds, and they started interbreeding all of these subspecies to kind of create a general falcon that would be best suited to be released in a variety of different locations. But with no adult birds to raise these chicks, humans started doing it themselves. Well, birds uh, do have a critical time in their development where they imprint on um, usually the adult birds that are caring for them. And this imp Imprinting is how birds get uh, roughly what we I'd call their self-identity, how they decide what bird am I, what bird should I be hanging out with. And so to help keep peregrine falcon fledgerings from imprinting on humans, we of course use really creepy peregrine falcon puppets uh, to feed those uh, little fledgerings in those captivities until they reached roughly around three to four weeks of age where they'd then be brought to um, hacking sites. And this started going on throughout uh, a variety of areas of the country. But here in New England and Maine and specifically, we didn't begin hacking until 1984. And the reason why was there was roughly little to no information on where should we even bring peregrine falcons back to. And so in 1983, uh, the resource management specialist, Carol Shell here at Acadia National Park and a College of Atlantic professor, William Drury, uh, worked together to evaluate historic and potential area locations on the island. Uh, because of this work they did, Acadia National Park was selected to begin a hacking program in 1984. And the location they chose to hack in Acadia National Park was Jordan Cliffs, which we can see right in the center of the island there. And the reason they chose that cliff was first, it was suitable habitat for peregrine falcons, but it also lied almost right in the center of two historic area locations here on the island, which are the Precipice and Valley Cove in Somme Sound. <clears throat> Well, hacking here in Acadia National Park uh, occurred in 1984, 85, and 86. Uh, this picture here is from the top of the Jordan Cliff uh, hacking site where they were um, beginning to release these peregrine falcon fledglings. And in those three years, the park uh, released 23 peregrine falcon fledglings and we had 22 reach adulthood. Unfortunately, um, during that first year, one of the fledglings did go missing. And we, uh, as the park does not have, does not really know what exactly happened. Uh, the best guess is that it fell out of the nest or the nest box area and therefore um, was just never found. But pretty successful to see 22, um, 23 or 22 of 23 fledglings uh, at least fly away from the park. That was pretty successful. <clears throat> but the reason why the park stopped in 1987 is because a sub-adult falcon 
was seen around Jordan Clips. And that Falcon is a pretty big um, character in this story. Um, back then we still named our Falcons and it just so happened that this Falcon was named Ganesh and he was a male from the 1986 fledglings. Uh, but the reason why we had to stop hacking is because falcons can be very territorial towards each other and sub-adult falcons are well known for attacking fledglings as they're learning to fly. And so although Ganesh showed up about three days before the fledglings were to arrive, they canceled the program and those fledglings were moved off to be hacked in other parts of the state. Well, our story with Ganesh moves away from Jordan Cliffs, and in 1988, Ganesh is spotted again at the cliffs of the precipice, and those are the cliffs on the eastern side of Champlain Mountain on the island. And that's about it. Uh, Ganesh was seen that summer. Um, he did attract a sub-adult female to the cliff site. However, uh, due to her not being old enough yet to be a mate. Um, he hangs around for a couple weeks or so and then uh, disappears. Well, in 1989, Ganesh shows up again. And this time he attracts an adult female to the cliffs of the precipice, uh, but no nesting occurs. In 1990, Ganesh returns again uh, was able to attract an adult female to the nesting location. We do not know if this was the same female uh, from the previous year. Uh, and they do nest. However, due to a late April storm, uh, the nest does fail. But in 1991, Ganesh and another female falcon, again, we don't know if it's the same one, they successfully raised the first three wild peregrine falcon chicks in Acadia National Park since 1956. And that was a huge, huge success. I like just throwing this picture out. This picture is from the Cliffs of the Precipice and it is taken about six feet above the current nesting site that our peregrine falcons are occupying. Uh, but I just see that in they have an amazing view from that nest site. Well, the precipice has been extremely successful since 1991. Uh, Ganesh actually was the male falcon at that nest all the way up until 1998. And therefore um, he was responsible and uh, the different females throughout the time uh, for getting a great start to the populations of peregrine falcons in and around Maine. Uh, but to this date, of at least last year, 2020, uh, the precipice itself as a nest site has produced 78 successful fledglings. <laughs> but what's even, <clears throat> what's another great thing about uh, the peregrine falcon recovery project here in Acadia National Park is that ever since 1991, the park has also been doing an, an interpretation program. And since 1998, which is the oldest stats I could find, the Peregrine Falcon Watch program has been able to talk to over 390,000 visitors about Peregrine Falcon conservation and about the hard work that many uh, nonprofits and government agencies did to bring these birds uh, back to their historic ranges. <clears throat> well, the precipice is not the only place that peregrine falcons nest here in Acadia National Park. Uh, they also nest now on the Jordan Cliffs, the original hack site above Jordan Pond, uh, which is the top right picture. They also nest in Soam Sound again, one of those historic locations. Uh, which we can see in the bottom left over Soam Sound. And um, every so often they do nest on Canada Cliffs or Echo Cliffs, which is the bottom right-hand picture next to Echo Lake. 
Uh, there's actually only ever been one year, 2004, where we had a successful peregrine falcon nesting site uh, at Somme Sound and Echo Cliffs. Uh, the best guess is they're just too close to host um, two pairs of peregrine falcons most of the time. Uh, with, as, a, as a peregrine flies, they're roughly only about a mile apart and therefore um, too much competition and they probably keep driving themselves out. In most years, what we do see in the general trend is that if a peregrine falcon nest fails their first nesting on Somme Sound, we then do see them retreat to uh, the Echo Cliffs. And through having um, all of these nesting sites here in the park, as of 2020, 160 peregrine falcon fledglings have flown from Acadia, uh, which is a huge number, huge success story, and is one of uh, is pretty much the legacy of these this program, is that peregrine falcons continue to do so well here in this area, uh, continue to do so well in the park, and are still thriving in most places that they can be found here in the state of Maine. Um, after each breeding season, when we do have the opportunity, we do like to go up into the nest sites to see possibly what our birds have been feeding on. And what's really fun about the Mount Desert Island peregrine falcons is that they often do have seabird in their diet or shorebird. Uh, the Valley Cove pairs historically speaking, are eating gulls a lot. And so we, and including herring gulls, which actually are much larger than a peregrine falcon in weight, but peregrine falcons are resourceful. They're able to take down herring gulls, but a entire body of a herring gull would be too much. So, so what we see is peregrine falcons will actually tear off the wings, tear off the head, legs, and they'll just fly back with the chest um, back to the nest site or their cache sites. And that's primarily because peregrine falcons are pretty successful hunters. They really only have to spend time eating the high quality meat. And of course, in birds, that is the breast of these herring gulls. Uh, the precipice pair has often been known to bring back black guillemots, which is really interesting to see the black guillemots red feet. Um, hanging underneath the peregrines as they fly back to the cliffs. And then the Jordan Cliff pair seems to often prefer woodpeckers. And they um, uh, often, we can find remains of woodpeckers, downy, hairy. I don't think we've ever found pileated, but also uh, northern flickers remains have been found in their nests. Another really fun fact about our falcons here at the park is that our precipice pair is often known for uh, feeding on those seabirds on Egg Rock Island, which is roughly two miles away from their nest site. But even more impressive is at Petit Manon Island, which is 10 miles east of their nest site. Uh, they have been documented sitting on the lighthouse, uh, ready to pick off a variety of different shorebirds and that are nesting out there on that island. Uh, this is a beautiful picture of one of our adult birds from 2017 at the precipice. But what I've really enjoyed about our, and following this peregrine falcons here at the Cape, the park um, so closely is, is seeing where some of our birds have gone. And these are some of the banding details that actually have been recovered for our birds. And probably the most important, or one of the most impressive ones was right there at the top. Uh, in 1994, we had a female that was raised on the precipice cliffs. And she was one of the first falcons to nest in the city of Boston in 96 and 97 on the Christian Science Church building. But she lived a long life. She was found dead in 2011, which made her 17 years old. The, the, you know, what we say is kind of the average lifespan for an adult peregrine falcon is 14 to 15 years. So she was uh, definitely one of the older ones out there. And that is truly, truly was a remarkable bird. 
Uh, we also saw a lot of our birds um, come back to the island, but also spread out into our local states. We had a bunch of pairs begin breeding in New Hampshire and Vermont. Uh, another one that's striking to me and really helps show why peregrine falcons are named peregrine. That's actually Latin for wanderer. Uh, in 1997, one of our males fledged in the summer and then decided to fly all the way to Cuba. It seemed to spend the new year in Cuba and that is where he was found. Um, and then probably the most recent kind of success story is that in 2018, one of the females from Acadia National Park was found nesting in Lewiston, Maine, um, which was really exciting for us here um, to follow that story. And I myself happened to go down there at one time to go check in on her one more time. And it was really neat to see that bird uh, successfully nesting out there in Lewiston. But the reason we are able to have this data about what birds is because we've also been engaging in a long-term banding effort here at the park since 1991. We unfortunately haven't been able to do it every year, but when we get the opportunity and we have the right weather and the right timing, we do our best to band all of our peregrine falcon fledgling chicks here in the park. Uh, an important thing to note and why it's so kind of difficult is we have about a three day window when we can ban peregrine falcon fledglings. Um, and that's when they're 21 to 24 days old. If we are to go up there too early, their legs aren't big enough yet for the jewelry to go on their legs. Uh, but if they're older than that, you know, 25, 26, 27, what happens is that's when their instinct kind of changes of what they need to do if danger presents itself. Uh, you know, from 24, from when they hatched 24 days old, when a threat is introduced, they just sit there. They hope that the parents are around to come deal with whatever's harassing these birds. But around that 26, 27 day mark, they start to become a little more mobile. And at that point, when uh, danger's presented, there is a higher likelihood that they might jump. Uh, causing them to fall out of their nest and possibly uh, die and or become lost. The, pair, the adults aren't able to uh, continue feeding it. Uh, so we always do our best to make sure we're in that 21 to 24 day range when we go up there with the climbers to grab the birds. These birds have a very exciting uh, couple hours in their lives in store. When we do show up, they get picked up from their nest sites, which as we can see here in the left picture can be some ledges that are just a couple of feet long. And they go on a ride. Uh, they get sent up in these bags uh, all the way up to the tops of the cliffs where we have a uh, staff up there ready to take measurements. Uh, we do a site check on the bird's health to see if they have any um, you know, mites or lice or any kind of visible injury that we can see. And then they get their jewelry put on. Um, here at the park, we do uh, put two bands on these birds when we band on this bird's foot on the left foot, our right. You'll see the standard federal bands. Uh, this is roughly just a serial code and what is identifies the bird and these often get reported usually only when a bird's found dead. But then what we also put on it on the right leg is a state band. Um, for the core for Maine, that is a black over green band. So the color combination can tell you what state. And then there's nice big white letter and numbers that we hope sometimes when perched that people with spotting scopes or really nice cameras are able to pick out those letters and number combos and be able to report those. So without having to find a dead bird, we can still get information on where our falcons are hanging out. <clears throat> but banding is not the only kind of monitoring that we continue to do for peregrine falcons. And in that case, for all raptor species, because 
Most raptor species also showed a decline during this time of DDE spraying throughout North America. And that other way we monitor raptor populations is through hawk watches. Um, there, and for us here at the park, that is our Cadillac Mountain Hawk Watch. Well, hawk watches began pretty early on. Uh, hawk Mountain uh, in 1934, I believe, ran the first hawk watch. And Hawk Mountain is very famous uh, for conservationists going there and starting to work on changing a aspect or changing a hunting practice that was going on on that mountain range where they would shoot migrating raptors in the fall and they were able to successfully uh, petition out this hunting act throughout that range and actually changed it into you know the hawk mountain sanctuary where they now count migrating raptors and so there were there were hawk watches starting to pick up in different parts throughout North America, but it took until about 1974 where the Hawk Migration Association of North America was found, founded. And this was an organization that started to take all these individual hawk watches and started to bring a place where all their data would be collaborated or, and brought together, so therefore, all this data that was coming in from these sites could be seen as one massive look at the raptor population here in North America. Well, here at Cadillac Mountain, we have the opportunity to view uh, these 12 species. Uh, we have st starting from left to right and top to bottom, we have turkey vultures, bald eagles, osprey, northern harriers, Cooper's hawks, sharp-shinned hawks, American kestrels, merlins, uh, broadwing hawk, red-tail hawks, northern goshawks, and peregrine falcons. We will definitely see those 12 species every year. Uh, we also have the opportunity on that to catch a little more rare species coming through, golden eagles every so often. Uh, pretty exciting time was in 20. 2016, we had a Swainson hawk show up at the Cadillac Hawks Watch, which was a very exciting day. But we've been counting these birds up there at the Cadillac Hawk Watch since 1995. And so we'll be going into our 27th year of counting here this year. And we have been an active Hawk Watch site throughout that time frame, and what makes us unique is because of a joint partnership between the park and Scudic Institute. We actually have a site that has some of the highest coverage that isn't one of the main sites like Hawk Mountain or some of the ones run by Hawk Watch International. And we sit there on that mountain and we count migrating raptors. Uh, these are the top three raptors that we'll see on top of that mountain. Sharpshin hawks and American kestrels will definitely be usually number one and number two. However, broadwing hawks are pretty, your chance of seeing high numbers of them are very uh, dependent on the weather. So we often average probably somewhere from 300 to 600 each year. But in certain years when the winds are right, the weather's been favorable for us, so not, maybe not other hawk watch sites. Those are days where we'll see thousands of broad wings come through, which is pretty common for hawk watches farther south. But because we're so far north, we just don't have the opportunity to see as many birds coming by. So those can be some pretty special days when we get those big broad wing kettles come through. But one of my favorite things to look at when it comes to our hawk watch data is we can also see the recovery of these species that you know conservation agencies have been working so hard to bring back to their historic ranges. Um, the peregrine falcon one, uh, we can see we do average almost double, if not more than what we initially started seeing in 1995 in the first couple of years, which is a good sign. 
definitely isn't as dramatic because peregrine falcons do have much more limited nesting habitat throughout the throughout the countryside than bald eagles do. But the bald eagle numbers are striking. Uh, since 1995, you'd see that we saw zero uh, for the first couple of years and very small numbers for the next decade. But eventually, as bald eagle numbers started to recover too, so did their flights past Cadillac Mountain. And we now see very healthy numbers of bald eagles come through the Cadillac Hawk Watch every fall. But what's really special about the Cadillac Hawk Watch, in my opinion, is truly the experience. Uh, it's a wonderful group of people that hang up there. The volunteers that we have here at the Cadillac Hawk Watch are top notch and amazing and uh, create such a wonderful environment um, for us rangers who count out there as well as other volunteers from Scudic Institute. And more importantly to the hundreds of visitors that also come by the Cadillac Hawk Watch each year. And often when you go to other Hawk Watches, you're looking up because that's where birds are passing by. But because of Cadillac Mountain being so unique as the tallest mountain on the Eastern seaboard, we don't look up or very rarely do we look up for us, the birds, we actually get to look straight ahead of us and actually down. When I first came here to Acadia in 2014, I had to find a new raptor book because I'd been so used to them identifying them from the underside that identifying a, a Cooper's and a Sharpshin hawk would be very different when you only ever saw the top of it. Same thing goes for a lot of these raptor species. And so it was a really, really unique experience to see these birds in a different way than we usually do. And we get some wonderful opportunities to get some beautiful looks at these birds coming by. But probably my favorite thing about our Hawk Watch, because we're positioned so uniquely along the coast, we get all these birds often flying within 50 feet of us on top of this mountain ridge. All 12 of those species from Northern goshawks to American Kestrels that we see here have all passed within my head uh, by 50 feet. And it is a truly, truly amazing thing to see those birds so close on their migrations that might be taking them all the way down to South America. And that is just truly, truly remarkable. And so as we kind of finish up this presentation today on the Peregrine Falcons here at Acadia and the Hawk Watch, for everyone out there who's listening today, I invite you to come join us on the Cadillac Hawk Watch in the fall or come by and hang out with us at the precipice in June and July and really have a beautiful place to come in, watch these birds, learn about them, learn how to ID them, hang out with some amazing people that share the same passion as we all do and our love for birds. And it truly, I would love to see all of you come by the Cadillac Hawk Watch this fall. Feel free, uh, if any of you'd like to take down my email address here. Uh, if you have any questions about birding in Acadia National Park or Acadia National Park in general, uh, I am always ears to help answer those questions. And with that, I'd like to thank you all for joining me today to learn about Acadia's Peregrine Falcon story as well as our Hawk Watch. Thank you. Makes me want to get outside. Holy cow, that was really cool. Um, thank you, Patrick. We have a few questions coming in. And folks, if you're watching and you want to have questions for Patrick, please put them in the Q&A box. Uh, we'll start here. Uh, uh, which of the two migrations, I, I think uh, spring or fall is question, which of the two migrations sees the largest number of raptors? Uh, for us specifically here at Acadia, we're just a fall hawk watch. Um, we don't do a spring watch from there because at that point, 
the coast that part of the coastline isn't as much as a funnel it's more raptor species filtering out from the appalachian and the coast farther south and so therefore we just don't see the same numbers to count there we're definitely a fall hawk watch um, when they're funneling in from the canadian maritimes and uh, eastern canada that's when we have the best time to see the most amount of raptors uh, i do believe uh, Bradbury Mountain, though, down south in Maine, is a spring hawk watch. And so they are, they, that's another great place to see migrating raptors in the spring. Yeah, and they're going right now. Folks are down in the, that's uh, in Pownall, I believe, um, uh, Bradbury Mountain. And a sort of follow up question for that from Mary Jane is what, what are the dates of the Acadia hawk watch, the Cadillac Mountain? Yeah. Um, so we always do our hawk watch from the last um, training, usually going on the second to last week of August by, but by the last week of August, all the way through the end of October is our count time for um, our Cadillac Mountain Hawk Watch. Um, you will find some intrepid volunteers out there the first couple of days of November if the weather's okay, but uh, it is a, um, that's our main time frame. I would also on top of that say our peak, kind of our peak day every year averages around September 14th. So if you're really trying to eye a good time to come to the park to see a good amount of raptors, that week around September 14th is a great time. When do your snowy owls show up up there? Uh, the snowy owls uh, tend to show up. The earliest I've ever seen one is the last week of November. Okay. All right. So there's a little overlap there. Or no uh, overlap. Uh, unfortunately, yeah. they, they tend to show up right when we close the road to yeah. the top of the mountain. <laughs> so they're, more, smart, they're smart that way. A little more strenuous to go see them. All right. Um, Mary Jane asks about bald eagle migration and where they go. She said she thought they were year-round residents. Well, uh, for us along the coastline, they are. Uh, many of our bald eagles are year-round residents, and that's because our bald eagles uh, habitually uh, feed from the ocean, or they feed from water that is not freezing throughout the winter. But there's many bald eagles that are um, breeding on freshwater lakes and ponds and streams and rivers throughout the northern parts of uh, Maine, Canada, throughout the entire country roughly. And those birds, we do see migrations of their numbers down south to fresh water, which they're used to feeding on um, to the point where they're unfrozen. There you go, makes sense. Um, another migration question is, uh, which non-raptor species are seen in greatest numbers during the hawk watches? That's a great question. Uh, we do, we do do our best to pay attention to everything uh, coming by. Um, uh, including butterflies and mi migrating butterflies and dragonflies. Uh, we cool. do our best to count them too. Very cool. Um, I mean, we don't see too many songbirds or many of the other bird species because they tend to migrate at night while raptors are primarily our ones that come through the day. But we definitely do see some large flights of swallows and um, night hawks sometimes come through during the day, which is really fun to see. Mm -hmm. uh, one thing that really caught me off guard one time is every so often we have willets show on top up on Cadillac Mountain. Mm -hmm. And uh, I was like, this is interesting. You know, willet, shorebird, what, what are you doing here? Uh, but actually young ones in the fall, and they're almost always uh, immature willets, will eat, they eat berries. And so they show up and they start eating a lot of the mountain crowberry that's still left over in the fall on tops of our summits as they're on their southerly migrations. And so Very those cool. are pretty fun to see. Very cool. Still got a bunch of questions out here. One from Diane. She asked about, you mentioned that sometimes the babies will fall and the parents could still can you talk about how, how, what happens when a, a fledgling falls out of the nest? Do the parents um, try to keep keep things going or, or what happens? Yeah, um, so it actually happened here in the park in, uh, it predates my time, but uh, from rangers I've overlapped with. In 2013, we actually had uh, a peregrine falcon fledgling at age, I think around 16, 17 days, fell out of its nest. So prior to it being ready to be a fledging or even start jumping around. But it happened to fall only about 12 feet and it landed on another ledge. And although it was outside the nest site, the adults were 
I mean, these adults have such a strong tie to the nest site. So like if, if, if a chick falls out, that's kind of usually the, could spell the end if it's far enough. Uh, but this one just happened to be long enough. Maybe it, maybe it begged loud enough, but it was able to keep the adult's attention that although it still had a couple siblings in the nest site, they still kept feeding it until it was able to jump its way, become mobile enough that it jumped its way back into the, the <laughs> scrape site on the cliff. That's fascinating, great. Um, another question here from Diane about um, what falcons eat. Do they eat squirrels and other mammals? And actually, if I could follow up too, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how they how they hunt. Yeah, uh, definitely. So I'd roughly say peregrine falcons have about a 95% diet of birds. Uh, they are designed to eat birds. The only reason I won't say 100% is because when they're young and they're learning how to fly, we do see them try and catch dragonflies and butterflies on the wing. Uh, and then also in populations where there's large bat emergences at night, we do see peregrine falcons eat bats as well. Hmm. Uh, but primarily peregrine falcons eat other birds. Um, so much so from small songbirds, um, you know, from song sparrows and goldfinches, all the way, which are just a little bit of a snack, to as large as herring gulls, kind of on a basis. Um, I've personally witnessed a peregrine falcon strike a great blue herring. And actually, uh, I also think there's a, I think there's like a YouTube video out there of someone seeing a falconry bird doing the same thing as well. And I never knew if this was a falconry bird or not, but um, it did strike a great blue herring. So they definitely focus in on birds. Um, primarily. In regards to how they hunt birds, I mean, we can see that in their speed, right? Uh, peregrine falcons are the, well, as far as we know, the fastest animals on the planet, um, where they can often dive over 150, 200 miles per hour. Uh, the fastest peregrine falcon ever clocked was 270 miles per hour. That was some crazy circumstances. They had taken it up in a plane and had a chase after a pigeon but pretty remarkable and put a little accelerometer backpack on it. Wow. Uh, but it's still remarkable to see a creature reach those speeds. That's that, that's faster than human free fall. Hmm. Um, so if you jump a skydiver jumping out of the plane, that peregrine falcon would have beat them to the ground by tens of seconds. Hmm. Um, but that speed, that is a peregrine falcon's hunting strategy. They circle above and then they, use their incredible vision that raptors have um, to spot birds flying underneath them. And then eventually they'll lock on, they'll go into what we call a stoop where they will fold their wings, they dive, they reach these incredible speeds. And then what's really cool about raptor vision and in particular peregrine falcons is they have um, bidocular vision or excuse me, monocular vision, not binocular vision. But what it roughly means is they actually have two focal points in their eyes, one for long distance and one for short distance. And we now know this because of slow motion cameras, what as a peregrine falcon's closing in on a bird, they'll actually tilt their head to go from their long distance vision to their short distance vision. That allows them to kind of strike with better accuracy. And how they strike also uh, changed, you know, we kind of used to think that they used to punch the prey out of the area or punch the prey uh, on the back of the neck, trying to uh, break the back or the neck to just kill the birds instantly from the collision. Uh, but slow motion cameras, again, we now know that that also just doesn't make sense, right? If you punch something there's a, at high speeds, there's a good chance of breaking your digits. They actually lock their hands out and they'll lock the fingers out and they strike with an open palm or what we would call a palm as an open talon right onto the backs of the birds, hopefully to kill them instantly. Mm. Uh, they then um, usually follow it to the ground once it's been killed. And in some cases, if it's still wounded, uh, they will, they have a little notch in their beak that they'll use to sever the spinal cord of the bird once it's on the ground. And then uh, either proceed to eat it there or uh, they will carry it off. The cool thing about falcons is they will cache food on the cliff faces mm. as well, which is pretty unique. 
for a wrap. Thank you. Um, from Dan Ring, can you give us an idea of how the nesting is going this year? Yeah, um, I don't have any numbers yet on fledglings or not. We tend to be pretty non-invasive. All of our monitoring is done from a long distance through spotting scope. And so we usually have to wait till the, you know, the snowy little fur balls work their way to the edges of the cliff and we're able to count them all at the same time. Uh, but we do have active nest sites at the precipice at Jordan Cliffs and Valley Cove once again this year. Cool. Congrats. Um, when banding the chicks, do you ever have to worry about the parents being protective and trying to defend the chicks away from the banders? Def definitely. Uh, they are, it's definitely loud. <laughs> it's, um, you know, that peregrine falcon screeching is definitely going on constantly as it's as the banding opportunities are going on. Um, however, they're smart. I mean, they're not, they realize that striking a 180 pound person isn't often going to necessarily end up so well. So they often do a lot of bluff diving. So you really don't have to worry too much about them striking, but they will. And so of course the climbers are um, wearing helmets because they do know that um, the back of the head is where they want to hit because that's what they hit when they're diving at birds as well. Mm. And so one of the best ways to keep falcons from diving is uh, by having someone looking at them and or painting an eye on the back of your climbing helmet because they do recognize that eye, you know, this shape of an eye means that thing's looking at me and therefore has a chance to retaliate. Another thing you'll see them, some climbers do is they'll put a little flower or they'll tape something on top of their helmet that kind of gives the bird something else to strike that won't harm the climber, but also won't harm the bird if it hits it. Very cool. Um, Diane asks again um, about hunting. When placed in the nest at four weeks, she asks, are they ready to hunt on their own? So this may be talking about the hacks birds or... Yeah, yeah. Uh, I mean, we took a gamble. I mean, when we did these conservation, there was no way for us to teach these birds how to hunt. We could feed them meat over the edge, but that's roughly it. We could, you know, we're not going out there skydiving with a bird next to us, catching something out of the air. It's not going to be possible. So we, we really hoped that there was enough instinct in these birds to learn how to hunt on their own. And luckily they were. But on the flip side, today, we do still see adults teach the young. Um, once they fledge, which is about, or once we consider them fledglings, which is roughly four to five weeks after they're hatched, uh, they go through a period of learning how to fly. And then once they're flying, you see the adults teach them things. Um, again, at the, press, you know, the precipice, a beautiful place to see it all happen and occur in real time. You'll often sometimes see the, the adults will come back and they'll lead the birds on the young on chases to catch the catch the food. And then as they get better at that, you'll see them drop it and they'll make the young catch the food out of the air as kind of a, a way to teach them how to hunt successfully. Hmm. Fascinating. What cool birds. Um, two questions left. And I think we're going to end right on time here. Um, Donna asks how climate change is affecting these raptors, she says the raptors, which could be peregrines or larger than that. Yeah. Um, well, luckily, luckily for these raptors, in all honesty, climate change is probably helping them in a lot of regards, uh, especially in the change of bald eagles. Um, as we see, bald eagle numbers are still climbing uh, throughout many locations. And that has a lot to do with, and what we'll see throughout a lot of bird species and what is detrimental to some is that generalists tend to thrive better in adverse conditions as things are changing rapidly and bald eagles are a definition of generalist uh, they you know historically we'd say can fish and climate change does help with the fact that water doesn't freeze as consistently now so you'll they won't have to go on long migrations as longer migrations as far so that's definitely going to help them have higher survivabilities. Um, they also are great. We actually have a big issue with our bald eagles here feeding on loon chicks. 
Uh, in 2015, we actually lost every loon chick on the island to bald eagle predation. Hmm. Um, they've been doing a little better recently, but um, it's definitely an issue. Um, so bald eagles are roughly doing pretty well so far. Uh, in terms of peregrine falcons, again, they eat birds, but they can eat a variety of birds. Uh, so they're not like tied to a specific one that if it disappeared, we might see the peregrines drop off because of that, kind of like the lynx snowshoe hare um, cycle, ecological cycle. Uh, but the big issue we have, uh, if, we've, if we remember my um, kind of precipice nesting success story there, we have seen three more failures in the last in the last 10 years than we, that's three times as much as we saw in the first 20 years, roughly. Mm -hmm. And that primarily, at least in my opinion, is due to more, not as predictive weather, more frequent kind of freak storms later into the spring, uh, which is gonna be the most impactful to the success of the falcons nesting because they don't have a nest and specifically bald eagles, they have nice big stick nests Water drains really nice from a stick nest. Uh, falcons nest on cliff faces, on dirt, on gravel. And so if you get puddles of water there and it's cold out, the puddles are just going to sit there. And if that's sitting on the eggs or the new burn, um, that's where you see a lot of hmm. failures. Interesting. Um, so I'll do two additional, I mean, two, uh, one quick one and, and a sort of related question to your bald eagle question. Are, are there any predators that go after peregrines or their babies? Uh, definitely. Um, the babies, of course, are, we would say, many things can eat a peregrine falcon baby. Snakes are sometimes an issue of getting up into the nest sites. Uh, but truly for peregrine falcons, as we kind of look at adult on adult interactions, great horned owls are the only thing hmm. that I would say are a predator of peregrines. And that is because peregrines, king of the skies during the day, unfortunately, they see just like us at night. And great horned owls are able to pick them off if they don't, you know, choose good roosting spots or aware enough during the night. Just another piece of meat at night, huh? That's right. Yeah. <laughs> All right. And just one final one from Dan Ring asks, will the Peregrine Falcon watch be held at the Precipice parking lot again? Uh, we, we are planning to do it this year. Um, the new staff is just coming on. Uh, there will hopefully be trainings by the end of May. And so by the last weekend of May into June, uh, as far as I have knowledge now, of course, uh, in this world we are now, things can change very quickly. Uh, but right now we are planning on having the Peregrine Falcon watch at the Cliffs of the Precipice again. Fantastic. Well, that does it. Um, uh, I don't know if the naps are still there and I want to say a quick goodbye, but um, Patrick, thank you so much for coming on and teaching us about these awesome birds. I want to just run outside right now and go find some of my own. Yeah. Thank you so uh, thank much you. for the work you do and congratulations on uh, on helping these birds come back. Thank you so much. And hopefully you all again, come out and see some of them. It's a great time. All right, take care everyone. Have a good night. Have a good night, everyone.